7. Crew I'm minding my own damn business, striding through the hallways at school and heading for the dining hall, since it's lunch, when I hear my name being called. Glancing over my shoulder, I see it's fucking Figueroa headed my way, his expression full of steely determination. Great. Since we came back from Thanksgiving break, it's been one thing after another, and it's only Tuesday. It frustrates the shit out of me. Most of it has to do with Ren too, which is interesting. There's more to Ren Beaumont than just a pretty face. Which deep down, I always knew. She's smart, she's kind to everyone, maybe not me, but I asked for that, and she's influential. All things I can respect, though for whatever reason, the word respect and Ren never went together in my brain. I'm attracted to her. When does respect ever come into that equation for me? Not like I degrade girls for sport, but they're just, there. To talk to and to kiss and to fuck. That's it. It threw me off when she apologized for what she said about me to scope. I exaggerated a little bit, just like she did, acting like our teacher questioned me thoroughly regarding her allegations, which she sort of did, but it wasn't as bad as I made it out to be. I was trying to make Ren feel like shit, and it worked, though I guess I shouldn't have been surprised. The girl is easily manipulated, and too nice. So damn nice, you get a toothache every time you talk to her. She's just that sweet. Ren has to know I say all that shit to get a rise out of her, and it's so easy. Her bird feathers get ruffled way too quick. It's almost fun, making her upset. Harmless fun. Can I have a word with you for a minute? Figueroa asks me, his tone friendly. Though I sense the dark undercurrent beneath his words. He's unhappy. Guessing he's unhappy with me. What the fuck did I do now? Oh, I know, I was born. With that supposed silver spoon in my mouth. He resents all of us rich kids, which is funny as fuck, considering he works at one of the most exclusive private schools in the entire country. But he's into the broken, damaged little rich girls with daddy complexes. He eats them up with our discarded silver spoons and then spits them out when he's done with them. On to the next one, and the next one after that. Like a damn shark swimming in the sea, a killing and eating machine. Figueroa is more like a grooming and fucking machine among the halls of Lancaster Prep, the sick asshole. What's up? I flick my chin at him, already bored. Let's talk somewhere more private. It'll just be a minute. I follow him until we're outside, standing in front of the school's main entrance. Not many people are out here at the beginning of lunch, so this is probably the most private spot he could have found. What did you want to talk about? I ask him, when the dick still hasn't said anything. He's too busy looking around, as if he's afraid someone's going to leap out of the bushes. Ren Beaumont, he says as he faces me fully. Leave her alone. His tone is threatening, his gaze hard. What the actual fuck? Is this guy for real right now? What are you talking about? Stop giving her grief in class. She doesn't like it. And since she's stuck with you for the psychology project, she's not happy about it, Figueroa explains. At all. Did she tell you that? I'm floored. She actually went to this guy, trusted him and told him how much she hates working with me. That's some fucked up shit. Yes, she did. Yesterday, she was crying, upset that she couldn't get out of being your partner on that project. His lips tighten into a thin, firm line. I tried my best to console her, but she wouldn't stop crying. I bet you tried comforting her, I retort. This guy. We all know he's been fucking Maggie in secret these last few months. Franklin dumped her ass when he found out. Rumor has it she's knocked up with Fig's kid, though I don't know if that's true. I hate how all the girls call him Fig it pisses me the hell off. He doesn't deserve their attention or affection. He's a complete creep. Tell Scove you want a new partner, Figueroa demands. No. She'll listen to you, they all do. That last sentence is said with total disdain. He hates that I'm a Lancaster. That he can't do shit to me because it won't stick. I'm untouchable, for the most part. Hell, I'm the most powerful person on this campus and most of the staff and admin don't give a shit what I do. They're used to the Lancaster white glove treatment. For whatever reason, this guy cares, he cares way too much about me. And not in a good way. Maybe I actually want to work with Ren. I take a step closer, my voice dropping. Maybe I want to get closer to her. Learn all of her secrets. What she likes what she doesn't like, maybe the more time she spends with me, she'll let down her guard and realize I'm not such a bad guy after all. Figueroa snorts, please, you don't give a damn about her. And you do, I raise my brows, you're just mad because you know, no matter what, she'll never fall for your tricks. Not really. She's such a good girl, fig a sweet little virgin who wouldn't dare to ever think of having sex with a guy who's old enough that he could be her father. Her teacher, someone she looks up to and admires. Figueroa's expression tightens, but he doesn't say a word. Unfortunately for you, Ren is saving herself for her future husband, not some perverted asshole who's her English teacher, 
I tack on, just to make him angry. It works. His jaw shifts and his lips part as if he's about to say something, but I cut him off. Ren might consider something with me though. I'm young, more age appropriate than you, that's for damn sure. Really, we're just two horny teenagers, working together on a project, you know. We'll definitely need some library time. Private time, just the two of us. I know she likes to study in there, it's her favorite place on campus. I'll make sure we're tucked away in a dark corner, and I'll eventually make my move there, among the stacks. She'll slap you in the face. Or, she might spread her legs wider and let me slip my hand in her panties. I'm willing to take the chance. I'm sure once she gets a taste of it, of me, she'll be willing, and eager, to experiment. With me, I grin when I see the anger flare in his eyes. I'm having way too much fun with this, but I probably need to back off. Knowing him, he'll run to my little birdie and tell her what I said about her. She'll probably believe him too. Which I suppose she should. Figueroa blows out a harsh breath, pointing at me. You so much as touch a hair on her head and all. You'll what? I interrupt, my voice scarily calm. You'll kick my ass. Bring it. I'm not scared of you. And I know for a fact I could destroy you. Figure getting soft in your old age. Your only exercise currently is rolling around with Maggie in the back seat of your car. Don't you get sick of that shit. He stares at me, his breathing coming fast, his chest rising and falling rapidly, and I shove my hands in my pockets, already bored with our conversation. Leave Ren alone, he demands, but there's not as much power in his voice as there was before. That's all I'm going to say. If you do anything to hurt her, there will be repercussions. I watch him walk away, amused. His threats are meaningless. They just make me want to break down that steel wall Ren guards herself with and fuck with her head. Drive her out of her mind with wanting me. I could do it. It wouldn't take much. The girl is starved for male attention. You can just tell. She keeps herself so tightly locked up. She's got to be harboring some secret fantasies deep inside. Hopefully they're sick and twisted, and she'll let me reenact them with her. This stupid project will help me get to know her. Learn what makes her tick. I'll figure her out, seduce her, and next thing I know, I'll be walking into Honor's English with her under my arm, my lips on her forehead as I stare at that jealous dick we call our teacher, sitting behind his desk. It'll be my fucking pleasure to put on that performance. A smile curls my lips as I, once again, head for the dining hall. I can't fucking wait. Teehee moment I enter Scove's classroom, my gaze lands on Ren. She's sitting. In my seat, Malcolm and Ezra flanking either side of her at their desks, the two of them competing with each other as they try to gain Ren's attention. Her head whips back and forth between them, a little smile curling her lips. I suddenly understand what Figueroa must have been feeling when I said all of that shit about Ren to him. I'm feeling it now, no matter how much I want to deny it. Full-blown jealousy consumes me, making my blood run hot and my head want to explode. She doesn't notice me until I'm practically standing on top of her Mary Jane feet, her head lifting so her wide-eyed gaze meets mine. My friends go silent, feels like the entire room goes quiet as we study each other. You're sitting at my desk, Bertie, I accuse, my voice low. My friends share a look, no doubt noting my ominous tone. Ren is seemingly unaffected by it. I thought we were meeting back here. I glance over at Ezra, who has a shit-eating grin on his stupid face. You shouldn't talk to her. The smile fades and now he's scowling like me. You don't own her. You definitely don't, Ren retorts when I bring my attention back to her. They're my friends, unlike you. Point taken, one for birdie, lay off, mate, this comes from Malcolm. I ignore them both, focusing all of my attention on Ren. Where am I supposed to sit then? You can sit at my desk. She points at the empty seat in the very front of the room. I grimace, no thanks. She rests her linked hands on top of my desk and the wildest idea comes to mind. I decide to go with it. Dropping my bag on the floor, I stop right next to Ren's. My, Charon sit down, nudging her over, which isn't too difficult. She weighs nothing, and doesn't take up much room on the chair. Her scent is heady, like a burst of wildflowers in the middle of a spring meadow. She's warm and soft, and she fits perfectly by my side. I sling my arm around the back of the chair, half tempted to pull her onto my lap. Crew, she's squealing, what are you doing? What does it look like? She angles her head toward mine, and our faces are so close, I can make out the faint freckles across her nose. Of course, she has freckles. She's sweetness personified. I'm sitting at my desk. I told you to go sit at mine. For someone who looks ready to swallow her tongue, she's pretty damn calm. The only tell being her pulse fluttering rapidly at the base of her throat. Her lips part, soft puffs of breath leaving her, and I wonder what she'd do if I leaned in and pressed my mouth where her pulse throbs. She'd probably freak the fuck out. I told you yesterday, I don't like sitting in the front. 
I draw a finger down the center of her back, and she jumps. Guess we'll have to share. The bell rings, Scove waltzing in at the last minute, doing a double take when she sees Ren and me sharing a seat. Don't you two look cozy? Nervous laughter sounds from the class, EZ included. Ren sits up straighter, her hands still on top of my desk, her attention for the teacher and no one else. I don't bother looking at Scove. I'm too enraptured with the delicate curve of Ren's ear, the tiny pearl earring dotting the lobe, the smooth skin of her neck, how perfectly glossy and straight her dark hair is. She parts her lips, her gaze flitting to mine quickly before she looks away. She can feel my eyes on her. Good, do I make her uncomfortable, or does she like it? My vote is uncomfortable, she's not used to male attention. Crew, sit somewhere else, please, Scove orders. Ren is sitting at my desk. Scove is mildly amused, I can tell. She points at Ren's empty spot, then come sit at her desk. I don't like sitting in the front. I'm sure you don't. Scove crosses her arms. Come on. I'll go, Ren says, sending me another one of those quick looks. She doesn't seem mad, more like she's afraid to go against authority. I don't mind. Ezra and Malcolm both groan their displeasure at losing their rapt audience of one, and I send them a murderous look. It does nothing to shut them up, the assholes. Ren slides off the chair we're sharing as Scove begins taking attendance, and I immediately miss her warmth. Her scent. She's rattled, if her shaking hands are any indication as she snatches her notebook from the top of my desk and clutches it in front of her chest. Can I leave my backpack here? Nodding, I sprawl in the chair, as if I don't have a care in the world, but damn, I'm a little rattled too. Having her so close through me, and I don't like it. 